Kann man ruhig offen lassen. Ja. Bist du starten? Ja, schon. All right. Hello, everyone. Warm welcome from my side. Warm is also the weather. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. So my name is Frank Jentsch. Um, I'm leading the product SAP BTP ARWAP environment. In short, Steampunk. Do I need to explain Steampunk again? I, I hope no. All right. Yeah, first question. Um, Who is already using Steampunk in one of these different flavors, offerings? OK, room for improvement. All right, so I would like to give you a short presentation uh, about Steampunk, but not only the roadmap, also a bit more of uh, the different aspects. I would like to start with the positioning, um, explaining the release schedule, uh, explaining the latest news and also the roadmap, uh, what we are doing in the area of partner enablement, and uh, last but not least, a bit of uh, Q&A, not Q&A, FAQ, frequently asked questions, uh, and explaining a bit more about the best practices which we see on the customer and partner side. Last but not least, then the Q&A section. All right, so where we are with Steampunk, with our product. So you already saw this um, slide in this today's session in the keynote of Boris Gephardt. So I don't want to explain everything. You know, we have the on-stack uh, option and we have the side-by-side -side option. We are here. So Steampunk is on BTP. It's one of the different side-by-side -side options next to the non ARWAP runtimes like Java and Node, but Steampunk is positioned as side-by-side -side option on BTP ARWAP based. So if we look a bit more into the general architecture of a side-by-side -side extension, I think it's obvious uh, on BTP we have our Steampunk system and in order to uh, access the data on S4HANA, we need to use remote APIs or we need to set up a replication or the like. But at the end, uh, we have uh, two different systems and in Steampunk, we have the side-by-side -side extension. Um, another very important aspect, and this was also a topic in, in different sessions today, also in the keynote and also in the session of uh, Ingo Bräuninger and Thomas Fiedler, uh, the importance of ABAP Cloud. So ABAP Cloud is the next evolution of ABAP. And I think it's also in the meanwhile very well known what are the different ingredients of ABAP Cloud. So therefore, I would like also to skip this part just to mention again, ABAP Cloud, using ABAP Cloud is the only one option in Steampunk. So there is no compatibility mode or whatever, because we started in 2018 with our GA only with with our cloud. So it was not the name at that point in time, but uh, at the end it um, was an um, ABAP cloud. Um, but uh, there is no other option. So you need to use our cloud is just enforced. If we are looking on into the product side, so our cloud is delivered with different products. Uh, is delivered in different editions of S4 HANA and on BTP. And again, where we are, we are focusing on the side-by-side -side approach ABAP in BTP on the right-hand side. 
So now looking a bit deeper into this kind of offering, what are the main characteristics of our BTP, of our product? So first of all, we are delivering quarterly releases. So it means it's a platform as a service offering and SAP is completely responsible uh, to operate these systems. So as I said, our cloud is enforced, no other option. And you can use it uh, uh, for partners and for customers to build and run side-by-side -side extensions and solutions. As part of our cloud, uh, you need to use the released APIs and uh, the service which we are offering. You can find this product in the service discovery center like other BTP services. Um, and uh, yeah, according to the alphabet, it's number one. And um, behind this uh, tile, you can see all the pricing information, the different service plans which we are offering and so on. All these details which are usual for BTP services. Now I would like to explain a bit more about the positioning of these products. So what are our main target groups? So first of all, we are addressing this uh, topic of education. So you can use Steampunk to look into the newest and greatest features of our cloud. So you can play around with RAP. You can also um, test these different um, other features which we have in the uh, connectivity area or in, in other areas, reuse services and the like. So for education, very important. In order to get money, of course, we we um, are targeting um, for customers and the main purpose for customers is to build um, side-by-side extensions to their core application. The third target group are partners. So partners, uh, need Steampunk for a completely different purpose because they want to build their own applications and want to uh, sell these applications to their end customers. So therefore, other criteria are also important like multi-tenancy and having a, a, the most cheapest offering with ABAP to set up a solution and provide this solution to their customers. And last but not least, uh, Steampunk is also used SAP internally for other SAP products, so for other products on SAP's price list. So in the meanwhile, we have five different products in addition to uh, Steampunk itself. So these are four different SaaS products and one uh, yeah, similar PaaS uh, product, which is um, the BW Bridge as part of Data Warehouse Cloud. All right, so of course we want to um, have the conversion because the, the trial offering is intended to uh, be a yeah, try and buy uh, solution and uh, with the products um, of SAP, with the other products we want to get further indirect customers. I already uh, explained a bit the importance for partners to um, offer their solution in the most cheapest way and in order to save costs we are providing uh, what is so-called system hibernation. It enables you to stop systems if you do not need those systems. And according to the um, yeah, consumption-based pricing, which we have, which is on an hourly basis, you can save money uh, in those hours where the system is only stopped and not running. So and at the end, if um, the system is stopped, it uh, takes only 5% of the original cost, so it's, it's not completely zero. It's 5% because we, we need resources for backup and, and file storage and so on. Um, but it's, of course, a very significant um, reduction. So the scenario is to use system hibernation. I think it's very obvious. So if the system is not used uh, outside of the working hours or if you are uh, running um, um, ATC, checks uh, for that purpose. So because Steampunk also offers the code vulnerability analyzer feature. And if you do not uh, need to run a test, you can stop the system and this saves costs. And uh, if you are using um, two different code lines for your delivery, you can um, also stop the systems for the, for the maintenance code line. And you can start a system only if you really need to do a correction, for example, and to test the correction, then um, you can also use system hibernation. Um, 
I would also like to explain a bit the, the pricing metrics. So Steampunk is based on two pricing metrics. It's the um, ABAP compute units, which is basically the um, memory of the ABAP server and HANA compute units. And this is basically the size of the HANA database. And um, as we have only these two metrics, there are no further metrics like number of users, number of requests, or the like. So it, it, this is completely independent. So it, therefore, only the infrastructure size is relevant. So and on the other hand side, it, it, it means also if, if the system is not used, but it's running, so then the costs are also the same, independent of whether there are 1,000 users on the system or not. So it's just based on infrastructure size. So and uh, in case of, a, of system hibernation, so if a system is stopped, there is no resource required for the other part, therefore it's 0%. But in case of um, HANA compute units, as I mentioned, we require backup space and this size. So then it's 12.5% um, of the original cost if the system is up and running. All right, next topic, release schedule. I mentioned shortly that we have a quarterly shipment of new releases. So these uh, weekends where we are doing the upgrade are announced for the whole calendar year. There's a blog post where you can see all these um, weekends. So we had uh, mid of May our last upgrade to so the release 24.05 and the next upgrade will be mid of August. So it's always the same months uh, per calendar year. Um, so this is how it works. So in addition to this um, major release, we are also shipping uh, fixes on a biweekly basis, typically on a biweekly basis, uh, not always, but uh, around four, um, four uh, patches, uh, four weeks, weekends. And uh, this is also explained here and it's, uh, fully scheduled also uh, in which weekend we are providing which kind of so-called hotfix collection. So if uh, you are getting a response in a, in a service uh, in a, a service now ticket that um, a bug is fixed and with a certain hotfix collection, then you can also read this blog when this soft, uh, um, hotfix collection will be shipped. All right, so just one example, what we shipped with the latest upgrade and what is now part of the whole landscape, what are the the latest features of the 2405 release. So again, this is available everywhere in all these different steampunk flavors. So in free tier as well as in the um, standard systems. Um, I just mentioned the, the top four uh, features. We are delivering per release around 30 to 50 different features. You can see this in the what's new page and also in dedicated roadmap uh, page. So we shipped uh, with this release um, features in the ADT area. So you know the, the RAP programming model. So RAP consists of a lot of contract checks. So it means you need to implement it, uh, validations, determinations, uh, uh, additional actions during save and so on. And you can make mistakes during runtime. And um, these um, issues are identified and with that release, we have also now an option to visualize these runtime related contract violations. So it means not all these violations will lead to a dump. So this would be easy, then everything is stopped. But uh, sometimes it's just a hint to improve the software quality and RAP uh, writes basically a log. And now we have a visual visualization of these log entries. Uh, another important topic uh, is the ABAP unit. In ABAP unit, uh, we also did a lot of improvements. So we added uh, an additional um, syntax highlighting in order to see it even better, which method call goes outside of this test class and which remains within this class. Um, so this is also very nice feature and you can you can see um, um, with these two examples that we have the improvements in all these different areas. So in RAP, in ABAP unit, or the next next topic is in the Fiori Elements area, where we now supporting the
the definition of uh, Fiori, um, Fiori Launchpad Spaces and Pages in ADT. So it means it's now a development object and not only a configuration object, which needs to be otherwise repeated again and again in each target system. So now you can define templates for spaces and pages, and therefore it's easier to deliver these entities. Again, this is uh, the definition, the layout of the of the Fiori Launchpad for your application. And last but not least, um, as you are responsible for application monitoring, independent of whether you are a customer or a partner, you need also take care of uh, certain aspects of yeah, monitoring. And we are providing the tools for this, but you need to look into it. For example, to monitor the growth of the database tables. And here we are providing also new features that you can see what are the tables uh, with uh, most memory and most records and, and all these things, and also to, to see which, uh, is, which table is growing most. All right, as usual, we are providing a blog post for each release, which um, offers all these features a bit nicely, more nicely uh, compared to the what's new section, so it's better clustered for these different topics. So this was the uh, release 2405, which is currently active. Now I would like to explain a bit more about the roadmap, what comes next. So not necessarily all those things in August, but uh, yeah, also in the releases after the August release. So um, first topics, most probably part of the August release. Um, so this is the edit functionality uh, within a, a tree view of Fiori elements. So today we are using the read-only version of uh, trees in Fiori, uh, but now we add the editable feature to these uh, tree views. So it means you can uh, directly edit uh, values or remove rows uh, in, in a tree uh, visualization in Fiori elements. We will also support email templates and form templates as a development artifact so that you can, if you want to generate emails, that you can generate the emails based on a template. Uh, in the analytics section, uh, we will offer a multi-dimensional analytics app. I think there will be a separate presentation only about this topic later also in this room. And um, last but not least, very important to build Fiori UI's uh, push channels, the support of push channels that you can um, immediately update uh, data in the Fiori elements UI's without pressing the refresh button and reloading all the data. So with the help of push channels, you can um, notify the UI to do this kind of refresh automatically based on other asynchronous processing in the backend. These are um, four examples of the roadmap in the area of ABAP Cloud. But Steampunk is, of course, also providing um, the infrastructure that the ABAP systems can run in, in, in a data center. And in this area, we are also planning additional infrastructure features or uh, improvements of cloud qualities. And um, for me, the most important aspect and what I missed today the most uh, is currently um, yeah, zero downtime management. So today uh, it requires a, a planned downtime. What I explained earlier with this is these four weeks end in a four weekends in a year uh, for the upgrade. So this requires unfortunately downtimes. And we we are working uh, on a zero downtime management that these upgrades are basically no events uh, and that these events require only a couple of minutes downtime and ideally only uh, not a complete downtime, but uh, to, to have the systems only in a read-only mode, but not completely down. So this is the, the target basically, and this is what we definitely want to achieve. In addition to zero downtime management, it's also important to support high availability and disaster recovery. I think it's obvious for cloud services. And um, uh, the last topic is a, yeah, a topic for the next calendar year. So this is, uh, cannot be achieved in this calendar year, high availability and disaster recovery. 
zero downtime management, we, we will have progress in this calendar year. This is also explained in the externally available roadmap where you can find even more details, not only the, the header line, but uh, also a bit more explanation. What does it mean uh, to introduce zero downtime management? All right, now I would like to move to a dedicated topic, topic partner enablement. So it means it's only relevant for development partners, not that much for customers. So first of all, as a partner, you need to know that there are different pricing models, how to offer your solution. And here I would um, recommend that you contact your, your partner manager to really calculate what does it mean for your specific scenario. So what are the resulting costs? Because it's, it's always balancing out um, the infrastructure costs versus some kind of revenue share. And there are different models. So I don't want to explain these different models. I also only want to say there are different models. Um, coming back to a bit more the technical part of um, how to build applications. So I highly recommend that you get in touch with the so-called landscape portal. The landscape portal is comes automatically uh, with, with Steampunk, so there are, there's no additional license fee required. Uh, you need to subscribe this separately. But then you can you can use it, and the landscape portal is basically a collection of apps for different purposes. So this screenshot shows um, how to subscribe to the landscape portal and and how to use it. You need to just click on the subscribed instance. Again, it's just uh, that's that's the dashboard. So that's the launchpad for the uh, landscape portal, and it's a collection of different apps. And for partners, it's very important. Um, so to know that there is a uh, one row which is uh, called uh, uh, which is collected on the header line product uh, where you can build a product and build a product is basically technically the same like building an add-on in the on-premise world it's also yeah these are also the basically the same steps and at the end it's also the same result um, but we call this now product and not add-on um, so this is one aspect and if you want to offer your product as a partner in a multi-tenancy fashion as a SaaS solution. We are also providing a wizard to uh, configure all the uh, all the different aspects within the BTP cockpit so that, that your application appears in the BTP cockpit uh, and is enabled to subscribe to that solution. So again, Landscape Portal plays a key role for partners and there are a lot of different functionalities within the landscape portal. The landscape portal is also relevant for customers because, uh, or for all cus for 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 all types of customers, because um, even the system hibernation, for example, is also controlled by this uh, landscape portal. So, in order to hibernate the system and to to start it again, you need to use one tile it's in the first row. Um, it's not in the first row. Not visible now. Not visible now. But this is, believe me, it is in a landscape portal. Hidden. Normally, yeah, yeah yes, you're right. That's why I also looked for the right hand side of the first row. All right. I would like to continue with the partner enablement. Um, for partners, it's also very important to understand the uh, potential two different options how to offer a solution. Um, unfortunately, only the first one is available today. So this is building and providing a multi-tenancy SaaS application. So this is how we started this journey, because at the very first beginning, we thought yeah, it's a cloud service and we want to enable partners to do the same, to, to offer a cloud service. But then, uh, the reality was that uh, not all partners are really prepared to, to offer a complete service because it, to offer a complete service, and it's explained in these bullet points, uh, increases also responsibility because if you want to offer a service, you, you are responsible to operate the application. 
not to operate a steampunk system. This is in responsibility of, of SAP, but in uh, monitoring the table growth, for example, of your application, this is in the responsibility of the partner in that case. And therefore, uh, it's a different model. And uh, there are also uh, a lot of partners who would like to run the very well established business just to build software and let the customers install this piece of software in the customer system. And this is exactly what we addressing, what we want to address with this so-called installable product, which is um, not yet released, but it's planned and not that far from now. So it, it works in, um, or it, it's, it's implemented completely, but not, uh, not uh, released yet. Um, and this approach enables partner to offer the product that the product can be installed by a customer in a customer system. Yes, one question. Yeah, yeah the, the question was, uh, if I build something on Steampunk, if I build such a product, can I uh, install this product not only in Steampunk, but also in an um, S4HANA public cloud system? The answer is, uh, yes, that's also planned. Yes, you are right. So there's uh, one release in between because uh, the release cycle in S4HANA public cloud is only uh, two times per year and uh, in, in Steampunk uh, four times per year. But uh, from the from the pure um, yeah technical feasibility and the the option and also the plan, uh, the answer is yes, it is planned. And this is, by the way, one of these great advantages of the same ABAP Cloud usage. So because ABAP Cloud is used in in Steampunk and in S4HANA Public Cloud as the only one option, and therefore it's fully code compatible. And um, due to the fact that it's also the, the same code line of the technology layer, it's fully compatible. Of course, you cannot you cannot do it uh, the other way around. So if you build something in S4, it's more probably that you also uh, refer to an application object, which is not part of the steampunk technical layer. So this would not be possible, but uh, um, building it on steampunk and also offering it for S4 HANA uh, public cloud, this is uh, planned. Very good question. So uh, I repeat the question for the recording. So whether it's, the question is whether it's possible to combine both. The, the clear answer is yes. Yes, uh, we, we have a lot of discussion with, with partners and there are also partners who would like to do both. This is also a great advantage because you can you can run for maybe smaller customers the, the, first, the first thing or even for, for trial tenants, for, for test cases. Uh, you can run it in a multi-tenancy SaaS mode. And if there's a big customer and a big customer saying, I have a steampunk system anyhow, I would like to run it within my system and I would like to have the data within my system and not uh, in a multi-tenancy offering, uh, you can use option two in parallel and that's possible. And that's exactly the idea and the advantage of this approach. To be honest, we already shipped it and we rejected it. So the point is we we need to complete the, the contractual framework. It's just, it's just the contractual terms because it creates a new contractual situation between customer, uh, partner and SAP. So now there are more parties involved and this requires uh, additional contractual terms. So this is nothing which uh, destroys the whole picture. It's just for the lawyers. All right, it's everything is done. I could demo it, but uh, yeah, we we need to wait. We need to wait until the lawyers did also their job. All right, um, I would like to explain also a bit of the difference. What does it mean uh, with regards to functionality? And I think it's maybe not that well known that even the first option offers extensibility options. So although this is a multi-tenancy solution, it's possible for the customers of the partner of a multi-tenancy SaaS solution, option one, to extend it. So we offer, in the meanwhile, I think 
since two years ago, we we offer that customers can extend a built SaaS solution by additional fields and also custom logic. So this is even possible in a multi-tenancy environment, although you know the other objects are not uh, client independent, so they are sorry, they are not client dependent, they are client independent, but we manage this. So so again, even uh, the first option allows field extensibility, of course, only via Fiori UIs, but these Fiori UIs are provided uh, uh, by Steampunk, uh, but it is possible. The second option, because it runs in the customer system and the, the, the customer is the only one who can use and access the system, this option two provides more extensibility options because the customer can see the code and can even extend the code. So the good thing is it's not possible to modify the partner solution because this is in a separate product, a separate software component. It's protected against changes of the customer, but using the same principles like using SAP objects, a customer would be able, if the partner want to have this, uh, to, a, a customer could use released objects of the partner in order to extend this product. This is also a nice feature and it's basically like, like it works in, in the on-premise world. <clears throat> if a partner is building an add-on and, and installing the add-on in the customer system, the, the partner could also provide a business add-in or, or other things and the customer could extend <clears throat> even the whole product with the help of Eclipse. Where Eclipse is uh, possible to use for extensions in the second uh, scenario and in the first scenario, it's possible via Fiori apps provided by Steampunk. As a special one, it's also a different concept because in S4HANA public cloud, there is no multi-tenancy option. So, and, and therefore, uh, in Steampunk, it's also called field extensibility, but it's based on so-called predefined fields. So you need to yeah, predefine the fields uh, with, with certain data types. So you need to a bit predict what the customer could do, how many fields and so on, but you are completely free what you are predict. Uh, and the good thing, by the way, is uh, it does not require any compile time because the field is anyhow there. And what the customer is just doing and mapping in the UI from an actual field to a predefined field. And this is just configuration. So, and it's different compared to s one Public Cloud. If you if you add a new field to the business partner, I don't know, it takes minutes um, before you can start using it because the, the whole, or not the whole system, but, but a lot of uh, objects are recompiled. And this is not the case uh, in Steampunk before because this predefined field approach uh, works differently. And the custom logic, this is basically comparable because um, the custom logic is, uh, is offered by the implementation of, of business add-ins. And um, this is comparable like in Eswana Public Cloud. Yeah. Is there any like guide, like a whole steps I need yes. to do? Yes. How can I make it? Clear? Yeah, I explain this later on in my slide reference. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, this is a, a really important aspect for partners uh, to understand these two different options and also basically, yeah, to combine both options. Um, because this, um, yeah, I think, I hope that it creates also. Um, a lot of business in the ecosystem. Ah, I see the uh, uh, the next slide answers your question. So how to build it? So um, just a bit of advertising. So I I gave a DevToberfest session last year. Uh, yeah, as the name says, it was October. Um, the recording is available, and uh, in this one hour session, I really built as a complete live demo. Uh, and multi-tenancy SaaS solution, including, including everything. So it starts, of course, it's a simple example, but but it uh, everything is covered, starting with the database table, building the wrap objects on top of it. So just build the app, including generating the UI via Visual Studio Code extensions. So then I have I have built the app itself, and then I I building I, I'm building the the product out of it, 
And last but not least, I'm doing the SaaS registry in order to publish it to the BTP cockpit. So everything is covered in this one hour session. So now I would like to the hopefully most interesting part in this session, uh, which is best practices. So what I presented now was basically more or less an overview, but now I would like to share with you some, some best practices, how to use Steampunk and what are the experiences and the frequently asked questions from our customers. First of all, I would like to start with uh, aspects of setting up the system landscape. Because maybe you're asking, oh, Steampunk, yeah, okay, this is our, but how many systems? Is there a predefined uh, system landscape? Hmm. No, so uh, yes, first of all, Steampunk uh, provides setting up a system, but how you would like to set up your landscape is completely in your hand. So you can define a three system landscape, five system landscape. You can additionally create a sandbox system that is completely in your responsibility. And of course, it, it creates costs according to the infrastructure costs, but you are completely free how to do it. So this is because it's, it's just PaaS, platform as a service. It's not like an S4HANA public cloud where there's a predefined uh, system set up. So that's different here. So if I would start working with Steampunk, I would start with a free tier system. Of course, this is optional, but it makes more sense to try it out. Uh, you can use it for 90 days and uh, then you can decide to, to stop using it or to convert to a, a normal standard system. And this would be the second point. Of course, you could also directly start with a normal development system. What I would really like to recommend is uh, not just creating your whole system landscape, even if it's planned or in your mind, uh, com completely uh, on the first day, because uh, it doesn't make sense if you if you did not develop something, then there's also no need for a test system. You could have it and you could also stop it and it's there, but there's no real value. So therefore, I would recommend to, to do development uh, until you finish the first iteration. And once you finish the, the first development with the help of a software component, because only with a custom defined software component, you are able to transport this to somewhere, um, then you can, you can set up the, the test system. All right, again, in a development system, your first task is, if you don't want to only play around within the software component set local, which is predefined, but as the name says, it's only for local development within that system. If you want to, to start a real uh, project, please create a custom software component. There's a Fury app for this. And uh, this software component and is also visualized as a structure package in the ADT and you can below the structure package create your first normal development package and uh, underneath the first uh, data dictionary object or class. So that's the, the development uh, part. And uh, if you finished your first version, uh, you need to release all the transport requests. It's the standard approach with transport requests in ADT. And then you can set up your test system. So the same approach like for the development system, but now it's a test system and you need to specify or you need to deselect the flag because it's not a development system. And in order to, to, to get the, feed, the, the objects which you developed in the development system into the test system, you need to also use the same Fiori app where you created a software component, but now you pull the software component into that test system. So that's also the difference to the on-premise world where we have transport routes. And if you if you release something, there's a predefined transport route. And according to the uh, frequency, it's um, available in test system after one hour or the next day or whatever. So this is different here. So it's not a, a push mechanism like an on-prem world. It's a pull mechanism. So you need to be in the respective system and press the pull or clone button. And the objects are imported into that system. So again, the recommendation is uh, create the systems only when they are needed and uh, furthermore use uh, system hibernation um, if you, yeah, for a certain point in time, do not need a system. 
So now I would like to explain a bit more about how to set up the uh, BTP accounts. So because we are fully integrated into, into the BTP cockpit and therefore uh, the steampunk system needs to assign to something. And this something is basically a Cloud Foundry space. And in order to get a Cloud Foundry space, you need to use a sub account. So it means our recommendation is below your global account, we recommend to create a single sub account for each single steampunk system. The reason for this is this gives you the flexibility to set up the trust configuration specifically for a steampunk system. Because if you want to log on to a system, to a steampunk system, either as a developer or as a business user in a Fiori app, um, this authentication goes through the identity and access service from BTP. And which IDP is actually used is based on the trust settings of the sub-account. In, in order to distinguish the IDP between development, test, and pod, you need to use different sub-accounts in order to be able to use different IDPs. So therefore, the recommendation is use a separate sub-account for a steampunk system. So due to the fact that we are integrated into the Cloud Foundry entity model, which consists of sub-account, Cloud Foundry organization and Cloud Foundry space, uh, you need technically, unfortunately, also a Cloud Foundry space. Now the recommendation is just create the thing, forget it, and that's it. So what I wanted to say is do not try to add additional meaning to these Cloud Foundry spaces because uh, I would see in the future that only the sub account will survive. So therefore, I recommend to have only one space below the sub account. This is technically required because the Steampunk system needs to be assigned to a space. But the important uh, thing is the important entity is the sub account. All right. And um, on the sub account level, you also decide during the creation in which region the subscribed services are located. So therefore, on sub-account level, you have the assignment whether it should run on AWS in Frankfurt or on um, Google Cloud in India or these different regions. So Steampunk today supports 19 different data centers in on, on three different hyperscalers. So AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. So in 19 regions in total. So last but not least, uh, system setup. So we explain a bit the, the overall picture about uh, system landscape at all, but, but uh, now if you would like to create a new system, what needs to be considered? Important, important thing, first of all, is in order to reduce costs, in order to avoid unnecessary costs, always start with the minimal system setup. The minimal system setup is the default, which is proposed. So this is one ABAP compute unit and two HANA compute units. So this setup is sufficient for more than the first time, just believe me. Another important aspect is please, please set up the system carefully with regard whether it's a development system or non-development system. So unfortunately, we have in the meanwhile customers and partners who are running the productive system with the flag development system. Uh, it also works, but uh, if you switch it off, it gives you more, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's not more secure, but it, it avoids direct changes in the system. So because the, the software components which are imported are then protected against any manual changes in the system. And this is also uh, how it should work and how it also works in the uh, on-premise world. So please, in case of test system and productive systems, please switch this flag off. Yes. No. But uh, we. it might be that in case of uh, zero downtime management later on, uh, we optimize the, the downtime management according to this flag. So today not. So today there is no dependency to the upgrade. So the upgrades um, are executed exactly the same for, for dev and non-dev systems. But later on, 
um, in order to be able to optimize the upgrade uh, towards uh, yeah, a non-disruptive event, we do some things which, uh, which are not so good for a development uh, scenario, but in a productive system, you don't want to develop something. So therefore, the idea is that we optimize the, the, the upgrade procedure in the future according to this flag. Yeah. So therefore, it's important to, to consider it. Uh, we also plan, and in the meanwhile, it's also part of the uh, um, announcement in the roadmap, um, that you can even afterwards uh, switch it back, but it's, it depends on different criteria. So, so we, we want to enable even customers that, that they can um, switch it back to a non-development system, although it was uh, incorrectly set as a development system. Yeah, so the, the question was um, how this flag is related to, to pipelines and um, the, the development and test process uh, with correction systems. So, so first of all, in order to, to, to clarify the name, so um, the name correction system is more or less used to, to, to really do corrections of, a, of another code line. So therefore, this would be some, some, some li something like a development system, but only for corrections. But uh, what you are referring to is testing within the pipeline um, and uh, for all those test systems which might only occur temporarily. So these uh, test systems are not development systems. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a very frequently asked question. So the question is whether whether we support reusing an existing HANA database or whether a newer HANA instance is always created. So the answer is um, a steampunk system creates automatically always an own dedicated HANA instance. Today, it's not possible to reuse an existing HANA cloud instance. So it's a dedicated own one. So we are providing a feature which is called SQL service that you can natively access this HANA database, but you cannot combine um, HANA databases uh, for, for other purposes because we, uh, due to the approach of the data dictionary, we need the full control. And also due to the fact that we are responsible, uh, responsible that everything works, um, and this is different to the on-prem world where it's a responsibility of a customer and the customer can create a, an additional schema and so on and so forth, but this is today not supported. So I would not say that we will never support this kind of reuse, but today uh, we started with the more easier approach. It's exclusively used by Steampunk. So this is, if you, the, the size which is specified here uh, is used really for a fresh new HANA database controlled by uh, Steampunk. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that the default sizing is is a lot. So believe me, uh, you can run uh, with only one single ABAP compute unit, even um, around or more than uh, 1,000 active business users on a daily basis. There are even, even more uh, features and more capacity, you can even uh, select the dynamic scaling. This is also possible, but dynamic scaling on, on up server level means you would also need to, to define a, a max size greater than one. So if you def define, for example, a, a max size of two ABAP compute units, then and switch on the elasticity scaling flag, this would mean that only in case of uh, uh, a huge load a bigger demand of, of, of business users, additional app servers would added, would be added automatically and also removed automatically. And this is, of course, a very good measurement for, for, for cost saving because only the, the required time would create uh, additional costs. And this is uh, for partners very interesting because if a partner is building a multi-tenancy SaaS solution, and as the name says, multi-tenancy SaaS solution means uh, 
there are more than one tenant within the same system and therefore it it could be uh, more easier to achieve that there are more than 1000 active business users on that single system due to the, due to the fact that there are more than one uh, customer in that system um, so then for partners um, having then maybe 10000 of business users across all their customers in the same system dynamic elasticity might make um, a lot of sense Yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, if it comes to dynamic scaling, whether uh, we are measuring this. So first of all, yes, we, we need to measure it because it's also uh, the, the costs are uh, uh, created uh, or calculated uh, uh, according to the, to the number of app servers which are live in that, uh, in that hour. But it's, of course, also visualized in, in the technical monitoring and in the BTP cockpit. Um, you can also see when this was uh, produced. Yeah, 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 yeah. You use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is the the technical monitoring cockpit, which comes automatically with Steampunk, and it's a uh, one one additional app, like an additional administrator app. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, uh, how long does it take to, to add a new app server? So it's real time. Uh, unfortunately, not. It, it takes a bit of time. Uh, yeah, it takes around five minutes. Yeah. Uh, it's by the way, it, it's everything is based completely on, on Kubernetes and Gardner. So that, that's not the point. Um, but there are also other measures to register the app server and so on. And, and the shutdown takes also a bit time because we are doing a graceful shutdown due to uh, technical jobs and potential application jobs. Yeah, next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the, the question has two aspects. So first of all, again, when when it makes sense or when I have really a cost cost saving in, in case of system hibernation. So I would like to answer this first question. So first of all, there's a there's a blog post about system hibernation where everything is explained. And in this blog post is also explained that in case of subscription models, you cannot benefit from a cost perspective of the system hibernation. So you can you can use it, but uh, the recommendation is please, uh, during the next renewal of the contract, move to a consumption-based contract. So. Exactly, exactly. There are different options. So pay-as-you-go for partners, uh, so pay-as-you-go models, or the former name was, was a Cloud Platform Enterprise Agreement. Now it's BTP Enterprise Agreement. All these contract types are consumption-based, where you have really a benefit of system hibernation. It's only the old subscription contracts, and, and there are also no new subscription-based contracts offered. So that's an old model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, yeah. Exactly. This is, is a topic which you need to discuss with your partner manager to, 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 to move on to, to a consumption-based model. And the second question was, yeah, uh, if, if system hibernation is used, so system hibernation, also with regard to the, to the runtime question, how long does it take to, to hibernate and to start a system is also around uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so it's, we will optimize this uh, further. So my, my next goal, it's not also the ultimate goal, but the next goal should be five minutes. Um, and, uh, but yeah, uh, as we are uh, counting the, the, the hours, you can really benefit on a daily basis from, from system hibernation in case of consumption-based models. All right, next question, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I check what kind of Yeah, so the, the question was in case of a multi tenancy SAR solution, how can I monitoring the, the system usage? So, so first of all, all these um, all these metrics uh, can be um, evaluated within the technical monitoring cockpit. So uh, here you have um, all this information about table growth and so on and 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 also dump analysis. Um, so you can today uh, measure the, the system CPU. The number of business users uh, is, of course, a very valid requirement. I'm not sure whether the business users are today available, but uh, technically it would be possible and it's just uh, a matter of uh, implementing it and providing it. So this is uh, definitely good good idea. So. Uh, yeah, before the 45 or before the 60 minutes? Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, so then um, I would only do a bit more advertising what we are doing on a monthly basis. So uh, we have a customer and partner roundtable each month. So the next roundtable is uh, yeah, on uh, 25th of, of June. Uh, I think it's also a very important uh, topic because I didn't say something about AI. But in the next customer and partner roundtable, we will provide also the roadmap uh, for AI uh, as part of our cloud. So please be invited. Um, I have, of course, a collection of references. And it's the last slide. It's the, the link to our different trial offerings uh, where you can get more information how to start the trial usage. So with that, uh, ask questions? Pretty sure. All right, are there any further questions? Uh, this is, I think the, the whole our conf organization will provide the, the slides afterwards. Yeah. And here you can also find me. Ah, but you need to you need to have to let the slides first, yeah. All right. Last question. Okay, thanks a lot for your participation and have a nice rest of the day.